It's supposed to talk about when your crystals bite. I'm, I'm usually less polite than that. I would have used a different word, but I guess uh, uh, what I'm going to try to do is talk about some of the pathologies that occur with crystals. Uh, many of these are deal killers. Some of them are not. It's hard to know when to give up and, and start over. I mean, the, one of the jokes I have in my lab is that if you if you uh, create a, a, quiz, a crystal that's twin, you should throw it on the ground and step on it and you know bleach it and make sure that it doesn't nucleate you know anything else, right? But uh, there are ways with uh, now to deal with certain crystal pathologies. Sometimes you don't have a lot of choice. You have to suffer through some of the problems that your crystals have. And I'll show you some examples of those and editorialize a bit on what works and what doesn't work. I mean, it's hard enough to get a crystal, but when it doesn't have the properties you want, sometimes it's hard to take. I mean, I, I, it, it's really hard for me to tell a student you need to get a new crystal form because the look on the face, you know, after spending six months figuring out how to optimize a crystal is just sickening when, when you're telling them basically start over. Okay, so uh, a, a number of the things I'm going to talk about have already been uh, touched on to a certain degree by others, so I'll try to go quickly over that. Uh, obviously protein preparation and differences matter from batch to batch, but also uh, you know even even very subtle changes. Um, I'll tell you a story, a personal story about how I got involved in the study of myoglobin. Uh, it was the uh, 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 first protein to be crystallized from, from a totally synthetic gene, not that the genetic material is, is, is that much of an interesting concept, but another famous crystallographer tried for years and couldn't get crystals of this recombinant protein from a synthetic gene. and uh, uh, he was trying the classic uh, uh, recipes from Kendrew and others and wasn't able to reproduce it. The, the, bio, the biochemist, you know, I pronounced him incompetent, but he's not incompetent. He's a very highly, highly accomplished crystallographer. He gave it to me to try, and I, instead of trying the standard recipe, I screened it, and I got a completely different crystal form, and I, could, and we, I couldn't reproduce the original form either, and it turned out that uh, uh, when the gene was synthesized, they went by the original published amino acid sequence, which was off by one amino acid, right? So uh, whether there's a spare gene or a spartate at position 122 determines whether it would crystallize in one space group or another. But this is an example about getting some crystals that didn't bite because the new crystal form of myoglobin that we discovered had higher symmetry, and it's been used for Lowry photography and for lots of different purposes, you know, where it has a higher, its higher symmetry has advantages over the original two to one uh, uh, form. But the, the, uh, when when your when your crystals aren't up to it, sometimes you have to go back and change the sequence, right? And I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but you know, take the tag off, leave the tag on. There's surface mutagenesis you can do to change the entropy of the surface. But when you when you when you get stuck and your and your crystals are no good, so it's always an option to go back and start over, as painful as that is, even at the level of cloning and expression. You also need to know your reagent difference. It's another another story I heard from, I think it was Betsy Goldsmith. Uh, she had, had crystallized a, a a protein, and this was back in the day when you didn't just need one crystal; you needed a bunch of crystals for heavy atom soaks or whatever and uh, wasn't able to, to reproduce it. To, to me, these are the crystals that bite the worst, right? You got a crystal once and you can't get it back, right? I mean, what's with that? I mean, it drives you crazy. You keep trying and trying and trying. In, in, in the second case, they had switched bottles of, of polyethylene glycol, and eventually, after six months of trying, they, did, they, they were doing anal analytical chemistry on each of their reagents, and then they learned that polyethylene glycol, that when it's synthesized, is some, sometimes quenched with phosphoric acid and sometimes quenched with hydrochloric acid. And, and that this is not on the label. And so uh, as soon as they started adding back phosphate, they immediately got their crystal form back, right? So uh, that's 
that's a story I, I tell people to impress upon them to understand their reagents in order to wind, not wind up in this case with the non crystals. Uh, another lesson I've learned is that you can make mistakes in recording condition. You, you know, we're, we're human, that means, you know, we. We're good at thinking, maybe not so good at executing all the time. Uh, we had cases in, in my uh, high throughput days when when plates were turned 180 degrees, and, and it's not reproducible because it's not the condition that you that you thought it was. Uh, uh, the, the the best way to ensure reproducibility and not wind up in this uh, case of not being able to get crystals uh, is to do a very careful recording. And maybe even hire a robot. What people, when I first got into the business of crystallization robotics, I, I was thinking wrongly about it. I was thinking it was about a labor saving device, but it turns out that the real value to us was in the reproducibility. And the, the kinds of experiments that you can do with robots are quite different from the ones that you do uh, with humans. So uh, hire a robot and use the human for things he or she is better at, like like thinking and being creative. Okay, so uh, when, crystal, when, when, when crystals bite for our purposes, we're talking about their diffraction properties. Uh, I don't know how many people know what Christology is? Anybody know? So Christology is the, the, is the study of the use of crystals for healing purposes, right? So about about once every couple of years, I get a call to the unit, you know, from somebody who wants to talk to the crystallographer, and they want to know, you know, what form of quartz is best for their poor relative who has cancer to hang over the bed. You know, this kind. Of, you know, that's crystallogy, right? So those those folks maybe are interested in the aesthetics of the external form of the crystal and so forth. But you know, we saw some pretty ugly crystals so far today. If they diffracted well, we're happy, right? So. Beauty in our case is in reciprocal space, right? How do you get a good diffraction pattern, right? Uh, not, a, not about the edges. Uh, in my own, the, the first crystal structure I worked on for my thesis, a arabinose binding protein that was crystallized in, in dialysis tubes. Uh, and the crystals were beautiful. They had nice sharp edges, and they diffracted to about four angstroms resolution. If they were redissolved and recrystallized, they looked like little boogers, they were ugly, and they diffracted to, to about 1.1, right? So you can't tell from the from whether a crystal has nice edges or not how well it's going to diffract. You know, for us, the, 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 uh, what we want is the measured uh, diffraction. And this, isn't, this is not to say you shouldn't look at your crystals. I mean, you can tell if a crystal is a single crystal, or a cluster, which is an important thing to know as you design your data collection strategy. I mean, now we have ways of dealing with things, even if they're not single crystals. But basically, you need X-rays to tell you the usefulness of the of the crystal crystal if you're talking about crystallography and structure determination, and not uh, crystallogy. But you know, if you do want to look at your crystals. Uh, you can tell if you have. Yeah, um, NAD or other cofactors in if they're colored. You know, one of the frustrating things I had in the structural genomic project is a general report from somebody that, that a crystal had been observed, and and I'd ask what color is the crystal, and you'd think that was an easy question, but there was no record. There was no, the color was not something that went in the spreadsheet, and getting somebody to go and find it and look at it was almost impossible. You know, this, this drove me nuts, right? I mean, what color is the crystal? I mean, that, that, if it's a heme protein, you, you might expect it to be red, right, or, or whatever. But, uh, so there are exceptions about looking at the external aspects of the crystal, but mainly what I want to talk about are things related to the internal order of the crystal, because that's what we care about in a structure determination process. So we've heard some talks so far about resolution. Uh, the first thing students want to know is what's good enough resolution? I say, well, what's, what's the question? And I'll tell you the answer. If you're talking about some uh, proton transfer in an enzyme and you need to know the position of some hydroxyl group or some donor acceptor, you need quite high resolution. If you're trying to establish 
whether subunit A is next to subunit B or C in some sort of complex, you might be able to do with much poorer uh, resolution. So what 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 is good enough resolution depends on the question that you that you have. It usually means in our in, in protein crystallography or or uh, nucleic acid, you could have to trace the chain, right? That's that's the resolution that gets you uh, into the realm of, of genomics and genetics and connecting the DNA sequence to the protein and all that comes with that. So if you can't trace the chain, there, there's going to be some uh, discrimination against your, the value of your structure, uh, even though, um, obviously, in some cases, even knowing things at low resolution when you match your question is uh, still, still quite good. Usually, you want atomic or near atomic resolution for our quality, uh, for a quality metric for uh, Structure determinations. Uh, um, in, in our structural genomics work and, and others, there's been a lot of work about how good or how good do your crystals turn out if you use a tag, if, if you leave the his tag on or you take it off or whatever tag you're using. There are a lot of anecdotal stories about proteins that crystallize with the tags, those that crystallize without a tag, some crystallize both ways, some only with, some only without. But the, the generality that, that has come out of it is that B factors are higher on average with, with tags, and the resolution is a bit worse on average. Your chances of getting crystals uh, without a tag seems to be higher. So in, in order to avoid getting a crystal that fights, that doesn't diffract well enough, we tell all our collaborators to remove the silly tag before you send it to us. Right? Put a cleavable tag on there and get it off. And this, optimizes your chances of getting a decent crystal. Okay, uh, quick reminder, we've already seen some things sort of like this. Uh, I'm going to show you what a small oscillation range diffraction pattern looks like. So here's the Ewald sphere construction that we talked about, the interact intersection of a, one of these reciprocal space planes with the Ewald sphere as a circle. If you're rotating the crystal, you get a moving circle from blue to red or vice versa. Uh, this is a uh, would be a good crystal. It diffracts to, to reasonably high resolution, and you can see these clear looms that are uh, very close to going through a point along the rotation axis. So why is that important? That's an indication of low mosaicity. We heard a uh, uh, discussion before about um, about that. So uh, if, if you put a crystal on and it, and it, and it doesn't diffract, then what, 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 it, what are your options? Well, you first need to ask yourself some very basic questions that most people in the room are probably familiar with. Is the crystal size appropriate for your x-ray source? I mean, when I was, when I was a student, you know, a, a 300 uh, micron crystal was pretty nice, you know, half of the half of you know, 500 is even better. Uh, 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 half a millimeter is, you know, that, that's that's nice. Um, uh, now, you know, we've seen with the with the XFELs work on sub micron size crystals. So size has to be appropriate before you can even know if your crystal uh, is good or bites. I mean, we, we've pretty much stopped doing screening at home on the rotating anode. Because what happens is it'll go to the synchrotron, we'll come back with a structure when, when we didn't even see anything at home on the rotating anode with a 50 or 60 micron crystal. So uh, uh, modern X-ray sources, including the x fill are really getting us into a nice place in terms of possibilities for resolution. Uh, we heard a uh, talk earlier about connections between high solvent content, i.e. few contacts in the intrinsic property of the crystal. Um, if you have too much solvent content, it might make sense to start over in the sense of finding a, finding a different crystal form. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we now are in the um, uh, fortunate position of having multiple crystal forms, thanks to deep screening that now takes place. Uh, there might be reasons why you want to work with a 
I solve it for them to get the structure and use that in the life of the replacement for a, uh, a higher diffracting, more tightly packed crystal. And that, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the old uh, view used to be you picked one crystal and you went with it without really surveying others. Uh, we've got some value from doing myoglobin in five different crystal forms. They're, uh, Sometimes you can learn about variability. Sometimes the crystals have different properties. They may allow different substrates to bind. They may be in different conformations. So one, one, one lesson I have is just because you optimize one crystal form and it works, if it's not too hard, go ahead and go ahead and line up a second one or a third one, and you might you might learn something quite interesting. And if you can solve one, then the other ones that seem to bite when you tried to face them will fall right into a uh, solution typically by marking the place. Uh, I already, already talked about this one. Uh, does your crystal bite because you screwed it up? Uh, uh, we know about the damage that freezing can cause, especially if the coefficient of expansion of your cryoprotective uh, solution doesn't match that in the crystal. Uh, you can always find out if you wrecked your crystal by doing a room temperature wet now. Uh, crystals uh, that aren't frozen usually don't have the, the same opportunities to go bad that uh, cryoprotective uh, crystals have. The, the other thing you can do is one crystal bites, uh, that doesn't mean all the rest of the ones in your batch are going to bite. Uh, now it's not uncommon. Uh, at the synchrotron even, to, to line up 50, 60 crystals and just screen them. And sometimes they'll vary from four angstroms to two angstroms, individual crystals. So the answer to that question, if, if the first one you put on only goes to four, try the next one, try the next one, try the next one, try the next one. So you can ignore the ones that bite and go for the ones that good. That are good. That's another uh, uh, way of doing things. So don't be afraid to screen a lot of crystals. We heard talks about mosaicity. This is a very common problem of people wanting to, to throw away crystals and start over. If, if even at room temperature, your crystal has high mosaicity, mosaicity that can create problems. So we, we saw some of these before. Here are the street spots. Um, uh, if you're trying to get accurate measurements, like for sad phasing or something like that, uh, uh, high high mosaicity can complete quite, quite a problem in the accuracy of the data. A lot of times you can get a data set and might still solve by molecular replacement, but your statistics are not going to be as good as if you have uh, a tighter uh, 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 fraction. Now, I've had students come to me and talk about how, oh, man, this crystal really diffracts great, right? They're, but, but they were confusing the number of spots you can see with whether, whether they were tight loons. So those of you that are new to crystallography need to you know, learn to look for tight loons, not sheer number of spots, right? Lots of spots. Is, too many spots, if you can't see the loons, is usually a bad sign in terms of the prognosis for getting high quality data. Uh, is uh, a large solvent content good or bad? Well, uh, it, it's it's uh, bad in the sense that we saw in that plot earlier that the that the resolution of the diffraction is not so great as the solvent content goes up, but uh, because of the uh, the of the concept of finite support uh, uh, converging on proper phases is much easier if you have a high solvent content. The power of solvent flattening and density modification is such that if you have enough solvent. It looks like you can almost start from random phases and, and, and solve the structure. All right. So this this magic number of about 50% solvent might make might be the difference between whether you can solve the structure and, and, and whether you can't. So uh, if you wind up with something with large solvent content, uh, uh, keep it in your back pocket. It might be handy for, for getting a low resolution solution that you could then to bootstrap yourself into a structure of a, of a better diffracting, better diffracting. Again, given our modern uh, methods, don't just 
don't, don't give up on multiple crystal forms because they have different strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so uh, let, let's assume that you've collected some data and the crystals aren't so mosaic and they diffract the resolution that you're happy with. What, what are the other things that can cause your crystals to be problematic and keep you from just knock, knocking out the structure? Um, uh, one is uh, translational uh, pseudosymmetry. So this would be the case where you had uh, more than one molecule in the asymmetric unit, one staggered with respect to another one um, uh, in the same orientation. So maybe you, you don't see anything interesting in the in a self rotation function. You might see interesting things in a in a Patterson function, however, that gave you some clues uh, for for this. So to be on the lookout for this kind of thing, the best thing to do is look in reciprocal space. It, it's it's hard for me to get my students to actually look at the data. You can make plots of reciprocal space. You can look at any, once you have your data processed, or even before, if you have a fancier software, you can look at the, you can look at reciprocal space. You can pick an arbitrary zone and a level and plot your data. And if you see fringes coming in and out of your pattern, that's evidence of you know, some translational uh, repeat in your crystals. And it, 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 it may turn out that your that your data statistics look look poor than normal because half of your data are weak and the other half are strong. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, if, if you can figure out what the pseudo symmetry, what the, what the translational pseudo symmetry is in your system. You can save you can save these crystals. Now these, these um, so this is not necessarily a deal breaker. But, but knowing about these properties of the, you know, in your system can be very helpful as you try to figure out which molecular replacement solutions are correct or uh, how to actually decide if you have a, uh, a reasonable uh, solution from the substructure from, uh, for your heavy atoms or, or whatever. Uh, X triage is pretty good about checking for non-origin uh, peaks in the Patterson map. Uh, so if you if you pay attention to the to the output from your uh, initial structure solution analysis, you can often save crystals that suffer from this uh, minor pathology. Okay, Tw twinning is a little more complicated, uh, and <coughs> sometimes you can save twin structures, and sometimes you can't. Uh, the uh, Laura used to be that if the structure's twinned, you need to squish it like I told you before and start over. I think we're, we know a lot more now and there's a lot more software now to help handle the, the cases of twinning, particularly if you, un, un, if you understand it. So uh, uh, twinning in my mind can, can mean several things. One, are, one way it gets used, maybe not exactly, exact, exactly appropriately, if you have two or more macroscopic crystals that are inseparable, Okay, so you might have one growing out this way and one growing out that way. You know, it's like Siamese, Siamese twins, and you know, you know something bad is going on. Uh, in, in the old days, one would try to use an ophthalmic scalpel and try to cut off, you know, separate the twins and go with one or the other. Uh, sometimes if you do that, it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, now with the modern methods we have with the uh, target of data collection, you can hit only one region of the crystal and maybe get yourself out of a, of a macroscopic twin problem that way if it really is two separate systems where, where certain branches of the crystal, even though it's not a single crystal, are uh, untwinned. Um, another possibility is two or more crystals that look like one in terms of diffraction spots but comprise different orientations. So th this is a, a, a mirahedral uh, twin. So you have essentially uh, uh, orientations of your crystal that are arranged in such a way that their intensity contributions from each block fall exactly on top of other spots. And so unlike this top case where you might see split spots or even two separate sets of spots that might be indexed separately, your Hebrew twins are more complicated. Uh, you can have a case where uh, uh, Two-thirds of the molecules are in one orientation and one-third in another. So when you essentially add the intensities of these and these, you wind up with 
uh, some sort of uh, almost an effort, but not quite uh, uh, distribution of intensities. Um, these are pretty good clues that the, about the twinning. Often in this case, the crystals will vary from one to the next, how much twin you, fraction you've got. So again, you go back to screening. You might try 50 crystals, maybe one or two or much less twin than the other. You can solve that one, even if it's not your high, highest resolution one. And you can go back and unsort the twinning in this other, in some other crystal that gave higher resolution fraction pattern. Uh, and uh, it, it requires some knowledge of crystallography to understand these twin laws. That is the relationship between the spots, uh, the, 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 the rotation axis and the rotation axes in reciprocal space that put these diffraction patterns on top of each other. Different space groups have different common twin laws. If you've only got one kind of twinning going on at a time, the chances are you can save this kind of crystal these days but it is possible that you've got twinning going on in more than one direction, which is pretty much the uh, uh, squish it and start over step if you're trying to uh, get your PhD in finite time. Okay. And the hedral twin is a little trickier. This is one where you have exactly half in one orientation and half in another orientation. And so what happens is you wind up with a symmetry in reciprocal space that looks perfect. I mean, this will process as if it has mirror and mirror symmetry, whereas each member of the each member of the twin uh, really has a different diffraction pattern. So you can waste a lot of time on these crystals uh, 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 by thinking there's one type of symmetry when there's really another. And th this uh, uh, can be uh, recognized if you're paying attention early on, and you can save yourself a lot of grief if you pay attention to the to the uh, statistics uh, uh, of, of your distribution of intensities. So the, 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 if you add these two, so the, this, this is basically an, uh, an asymmetric pattern with a certain expected distribution of intensities as a function of uh, fraction at that intensity. And uh, uh, this one should be the same. And, but he, but this, this has extra symmetry, and uh, these would be centric and would be expected to have a different uh, uh, distribution. So the, the, uh, there's some twin servers that can help you catch this pathology. Yes? And there's one other opportunity where crystals are perfectly fine and just hold on at the same Yeah, right. So there, there's also an indexing ambiguity, right? Uh, you can have. Uh, 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 separate single crystals that are this orientation and this orientation, and sometimes your program indexes them like this, and sometimes your program indexes them like that. But those are not th those are th those are separate data sets, and it's uh, uh, relatively easy, even for uh, SFX these days, to figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again in terms of putting the lefts with the lefts and the rights with the rights. Although that was a that was a problem that, that uh, uh, held the field back for a little while figuring out. But there's another thing. Today, if you have all the data that you have, you have to access all extra data. Are perfectly fit. You should pull them out. So that's all these vectors and the other. So say that, I'm sorry. So all the data that you have to be able to do with CTVX yeah. are perfectly fit. Right. Yeah, right. So I would argue that that's 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 a crystallographer induced twinning. Yeah, that, right. That's not just, that's <laughs> that's, not just, you can't. That's when the crystallographer bites instead of the yeah. crystal bite. <laughs> so it could be obvious. This is perfectly fine, but the program does something bad to the data. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so. Uh, yeah, we can't, can't blame the crystal for that one, though. That, that's just a property that stays good. Okay, so uh, uh, again, it, uh, in, in, uh, sometimes you can find a crystal that's not so twin, and you can, and sometimes you can disentangle this this twinning process. Uh, if you see those statistics and you can get some handle on the structure by molecular replacement or whatever, you're 
Your R factor may suck. You can try 20 laws, and a lot of the software now will do this sort of left-right um, averaging, and, and you can save a structure and publish it even though it's twinned. Okay. So, uh, one interesting thing uh, is that uh, uh, the presence of pseudo-translational non-personographic symmetry actually has the opposite effect on the intensity distribution as does twinning. So if you're really unlucky and your crystal really bites, you've got some non-translational symmetry and it's twinned, but it looks normal, right, in terms of the intensity st statistics. So you can really get fooled by that one. So that's why it's nice to look at your diffraction patterns and look for evidence of modulation or other kinds of Patterson peak, so you don't get caught on that one. Uh, uh, so the, the, it, you can get indications of negative twinning in the statistics. Well, what's a negative twin? Well, it's a trans, it has pseudo-translational symmetry almost certainly. Okay. So this sort of uh, combination of, of, uh, of, uh, of the two can really throw you for a while. So the, those are really nasty crystals. Uh, another kind of uh, pathology that's been noted that that uh, takes a while to sort out and may or may not fall in the category of you should squish it and start over is when you have two different lattices in the same crystal. So recognizes as, a, as the same crystal. This is a, a, a bipolar disorder. Uh, uh, there's a monoclinic that these data can be indexed and get reasonable statistics with a monoclinic lattice shown by the the, the red circles here, or it can be indexed with an orthorhombic lattice that picks some of the same but some different spots, right? So it looks like, you know, two different crystals in the same one. And on the other hand, these were these were single crystals. This is uh, uh, work published by uh, uh, Dowder all the title was pathological uh, crystallography, and. Uh, these kinds of crystals turned out through heroic efforts to be solved by, guess what, finding one that wasn't quite so twinned, it was dominated by one more than the other. But it turns out there's an orthorhombic and a monoclinic form that are related to each other by how the layers are stacked in this direction. So in the orthorhombic form, it's this, 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 back and forth. In the monoclinic form, it's sort of a mono, monotonic change. So, um, uh, they were able, in the end, to explain how, how they got uh, monoclinic and orthorhombic crystals as a, as, a, as a twin. But this took expert crystallographers a longer time to figure this out than it probably would have taken if they squished the crystal and started over. But they had fun. They did have fun. Yeah. Uh, other types of pathologies that sometimes you can save yourself from and other times you have to start over are uh, 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 variations, typically variations in layers of crystals. You can have a, a modulated structure where every other unit cell is sometimes uh, twisted a little bit with respect to the first one. In this case, this vector Q describing the, the nature of the deviations from the average in the transverse direction is commensurate with the lattice. That is, the vector has a length of, of 0.5 times A star, so, so uh, 2 times A, right? And so that, that case gives rise to spots sort of uh, between the other spots that are kind of weak, and you don't know whether to count them or not. The ugly. You can also have an incommensurate uh, relationship of this vector with respect to the transverse uh, displacements, and that gives rise to, to other kinds of effects. So um, you, you wind up with these spots that are almost there, but not quite, or in the case of commensurate ones, sometimes you wind up with extra spots. And uh, uh, sometimes you can, you can save yourself from this, and sometimes you're better off squishing the crystal. Uh, uh, again, molecular replacement is a little easier to pull off um, because uh, you don't need quite the accuracy. So I've, I've done, done some work on some of these kinds of displacement disorders, and I've just given you uh, a, a little guide on how to think about 
some of the disorders that you might see in in your crystals that bite. So uh, this is a, a nice diffraction pattern from this hypothetical array of six atom structures in, in an array. The, the array is actually bigger than this, but here, here's perfect crystal. Um, if you uh, randomly move each of the atoms and each of these structures a little bit, you, you wind up with uh, less than perfect constructive and destructive interference. This gives rise to this ring in reciprocal space. Uh, uh, people always refer to this ring in protein crystals as the water ring, but it's not just the water ring. It's also the ring from the independent atomic motions of each uh, protein. Otherwise, why would it be at different radii for different proteins? It's because they different, have different amplitudes of, in, uh, of, of atomic motions. So your, your B factor goes up, you lose some of your higher angle spots, and you pick up some of this uh, in, internal diffuse scatter. Now, uh, uh, this is a case where I moved the entire six atom object as one coherent block. And in that case, the constructive and destructive interference from within one structure is retained. And so you see in the background the Fourier transform of a six membered ring, right? Uh, it rises up from the origin where it's zero because at low enough resolution, the structures are all still the same. At higher resolution, they start to be different. And so if you see things in the background of your ugly crystals, and you can see a diffraction pattern in the background. That's the diffraction pattern of the, of, uh, the part that's moving as a block. There are examples of this where you can see a fiber pattern of DNA in the background of a protein crystal. There are examples of this where you can see evidence of coiled coil uh, in, in uh, leucine zipper type proteins. Um, there are numerous examples where you see so the case in your checkered past where you saw that. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So. Um, uh, uh, I may get to that if I don't run out of time. So yeah, again, if you move pairs of atoms, in this case, these pairs that are like like this are moving as a block. It's like moving a little uh, a pair of slips around, and so you see modulation in the background like this. The more interesting one that's more commonly seen in pathology of proteins is the next one, uh, where you have a uh, a transverse uh, wave. You have uh, streak spots that mean that there's uh, a, a vector corresponding to the, the vector I showed in the last slide, with things moving sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left. This can be, doesn't have to be a sine wave, it can be a mixture of a whole bunch of different length like, vectors, and so you wind up with streak spots that, uh, uh, in this case. Um, other examples you could talk about compression waves and so forth, but crystals tend not to show these kinds of things. This is a, the most common kind of pathology, which can be a deal killer. Okay. General statements about these, these kinds of crystals with uh, uh, variational scatter. Uh, whatever units are varying in non-correlated ways with other groups, have uh, their intensity transforms added as the huge scatter in the background. I already talked about that. Oops, I'm going over there. All right. So th this may have been the, the something that Ed, Ed was referring to. Uh, people, I, I see slides that the solvent content goes from 20 to 80 percent. Well, no, this one's got 95 percent. I mean, this is a, a, a very unusual, I call it three-dimensional chicken wire. But the, 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 these crystals are extremely open. They're extremely fragile. You can't manipulate them. You have to be. They have to be grown in the capillary in which they're x-rayed. They, they show some of this uh, diffuse scattering, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this, but the, the streaks that you see come from the, the collective motion of the arms in each of that, in each of that lattice. So uh, uh, what some people view as a nuisance, like Ed pointed out, other crystal wipers have fun analyzing. So uh, I had some fun looking at the the pathologies that come out of the diffraction of that crystal. Another thing we worked on is tRNA. tRNA is L-shaped. It has uh, 
uh, a, a bending mode that exists in the lattice. This shows up in the form of streaks in certain regions of reciprocal space. It has a slightly melted anticodon stem uh, 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 and shows sharp diffuse scattering, at a, uh, 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 not sharp, but the diffuse scattering at about 3.4 onstroms, which is the separation between the base pairs. So if you can get the average structure, sometimes you can <coughs> earn interesting things from these uh, crystal pathologies. Here, here's another one that looked at the uh, uh, mod modulation of the protein calmodulin, and it turns out, you know, calmodulin is this uh, barbell-shaped thing that can flex, and those flexing modes are actually reflected in in the properties of the lattice. Uh, this is a experimental. This is a calculated diffraction pattern where we where we accounted for these. So again, this assumes that you've got the basic structure solved. Uh, otherwise, uh, these kinds of pathologies can be a real problem. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is a case in point from some of our work where we were able to save a, a structure. Um, every other row in this diffraction pattern was, was these streaks. This corresponds exactly what I described with diffuse scattering. There's a vector, the length of the, the direction of the streaks is the direction of the vector, and the, the buildup of where they are in space suggests these are uh, transverse displacement waves with this, with this certain vector. So basically what's going on here is this is that, this is that vector. Some of the unit cells are slid down uh, with respect to the original one. Uh, it's a commensurate because it's exactly the odd ones that are affected, the even ones are okay. So this is an example of a, of a commensurate uh, uh, transverse uh, wave displacement. And um, we were able to solve the structure basically by ignoring these uh, and considering that the unit cell was smaller, but the R factor was not publishable, there's no way we were going to be able to solve it. But this was a paper that uh, where we wanted to include uh, the complete set of glycosyl transferases. There are four in this pathway, and this is the fourth one, and we really wanted it. Right? So we, we worked hard to figure out how to deal with this pathology. And uh, 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 there, there is a way, essentially, of uh, recalculating and boosting the measured intensities that you get here with a fudge factor for the fraction of, of uh, molecules that are, that are switched in position relative to the perfect crystal. Now, this is a, uh, this correction uh, what has been written about and described by Jim and Wang uh, for crystals containing lattice translocation defects. So, when, when crystals bind in this kind of specific way, sometimes you can save them. So we, we were able to get a publishable R factor uh, by treating this pathology. Okay. Uh, I'd like to sort of wind up, wind up here. So uh, you know, I have a, have a Mini Cooper and one of their, as a, that I drive, and one of their uh, marketing advertisement is large is no longer in charge, right? Which I thought was kind of cute. But that the may the thing the same thing may apply to crystals. Large crystals may not longer be in charge. Small crystals they're harder to see, as we've heard talked about. Um, uh, we also enjoy use of the the Jan Scientific UV fluorescent images that help us identify uh, small crystals for further optimization. Uh, we know small crystals are harder to hit, but now with the uh, rastering capability of finding the crystals at the beam with the new, I just got, I just saw a presentation from uh, Bob Fischetti at, at the GMCA beam line where they're able to now, in a few seconds, uh, scan about 100 different positions looking for crystals and looking for the best diffraction with an attenuated beam. So you, you don't even have to really have that good of an aim. You can just raster over the region where you think there might be crystals. Uh, uh, small crystals, there's some evidence that small crystals may diffract better in the, in, in the sense that they don't have as many opportunities to pick up those lattice translocation uh, defects. They, they may be more perfect to begin with, at least the ones that you can see. Uh, you can pick better ones. The better, maybe a better way of saying that is you can pick crystals with fewer defects if you've got lots of shots. 
Um, there's also some uh, evidence that uh, they may not be quite as sensitive to radiation damage, but if you're doing uh, uh, serial thin to second crystallography or getting other or having doing other multi-crystal effects, it, uh, the radiation damage uh, may not be quite so much an issue. The other advantage that small crystals allow that big crystals uh, bite for is trying to diffuse things in quickly. Uh, a one micron uh, crystal has a, uh, a, a millisecond or less diffusion time for, for getting things inside it. So you may be able to do rapid, rapid mixing experiments on the millisecond time scale for time resolved crystallography with small crystals, whereas that would be an impossible uh, feat with large crystals because of the slow time for uh, diffusion. So uh, there, there's hope that uh, small crystals will have lots of advantages, where the, whereas the large crystals that we used to have to get good signal to noise will fall into the category of, of, uh, of being not so good. So um, I'll stop there and entertain any comments or questions.